been a little minute, but we have a lot to talk about. We got the Eagles, the Phillies clinched a playoff berth, the big trade with Dame Lillard going to the Milwaukee Bucks, as well as the big fight coming up this weekend between um, Charlo and Canelo. I, I never get his name right. I think it's Jermel Charlo, the younger Charlo, and Canelo Alvarez for undisputed at 168 pounds. So a lot to talk about here. But before I get into it, my YouTube family, make sure you like, subscribe, um, share the video so people know what I'm dropping. And without further ado, let's go ahead and talk about what we came here to talk about first, and that's the Philadelphia Eagles. I haven't talked about them enough this year, and no time like the present. Big win over the Tampa Bay Buccaneers down in Raymond James Stadium. Or I, I think that's what it's still called. 25-11 to 11 on the road. Very dominant win. Battle of the undefeateds. We were 2-0 going in against a 2-0 Buccaneers team that was playing pretty solid under Baker Mayfield's stewardship. But we went in there and we shut them down. They had no answers on offense for us. And then on, on defense, we were pretty much able to move up and down the field on the ground. And um, they, they had some moments. They had their moments. They surely did. But we were able to control the game. And it was one of those wins where if this is the floor... Tell me where the damn ceiling's at. Because they played really, really well. Even through all the mistakes, through all the criticism that we've gotten in the first two weeks. If this is the floor, it's crazy. So I'm reading this article here on MSN.com. And it's talking about three things we learned from the Philadelphia Eagles in week three. And the first thing, like I said, is their floor is pretty damn good. All right. The, they say the way the Eagles fans and the national media have been talking about the team, you'd think they were 0-3. And the sky was falling. But instead, we're on top of the NFC East. Surprise, surprise. Because the Cowgirls got upended and embarrassed by the Arizona Cardinals. The Cardiac Cardinals. So they're 2-1 on one now. Uh, the Giants, they're not undefeated. The Commanders, they're not undefeated. Guess who is undefeated? These guys, man. So we, we got to keep playing consistently. Even when we don't play our best game, we have to be consistent in the little things that we do. Secondly, the run game has kept us in it. And one of the big pickups of the offseason was DeAndre Swift. Now, I didn't make a video about it, but I've talked to my friends and people that I know. And I mentioned that if DeAndre Swift gets 12 to 15 touches a game, whether that be through the air or on the ground or both, he will be an all-pro this year. And damn if I was not right. Because you, the talent's there. And yo, what, what up, Mark, man? Thanks for checking in, man. Yo, Bird Game. You know what time it is. It, it's, it's one thing. You know what DeAndre Swift is. Swift is in his last name. And you see the cuts that he makes, the moves he makes, the jukes, have people falling out of their cleats. He did that with the Lions. We saw that from DeAndre Swift last year in game one, a game that we almost lost against the Lions, who were pretty damn good this year again. We saw what DeAndre Swift was. It's just he can never stay healthy. Always has soft tissue injuries, always on the sidelines. But with this committee that we have right now, Boston Scott, who will be coming back healthy, uh, Kenneth Gainwell, who will be coming back healthy, Rashad Penny, who's damn near a healthy scratch. That's how deep your running back room is this year. And then DeAndre Swift, you don't got to put the world on his shoulders. He doesn't have to lift the at Atlas Stones on his right, you know, on his shoulders and, and do it by himself. He can get the, the touches he needs, and if he needs a breather or if he's a little banged up, he can sit down until he's ready to come back in. That's the beauty of what we have right now with this rotation in the backfield. And you've seen it. The first two weeks, he's been lighting people up. This week, no different. They they And they showed the replay. Um, Devin White, he had to respect the play fake so much that him and the other linebacker started bailing out to go to the second level. Meanwhile, all Jalen Hurts got to do is hand it off to Swift, and boom. You have gaps the size of the Grand King and opening up on the left side, on the right side. It don't matter what side he's running to. <laughs> the lanes are there. That's why he's getting 5, 10, sometimes 25 a pop. So, you know, that run game is a passing league. I get it. But... When it comes down to it, if you're strong in the trenches on both sides, especially on the offensive side, you can run the ball at will. It don't matter if your quarterback's having an off game or if your wide receivers are not getting separation or your tight end's getting doubled. Guess what? We're going to run the ball down your throat, and we're going to tell you what direction we're running the ball. You still can't do nothing about it. 
And on top of that, you have an offensive line that's being stewarded by a quarterback that can squat 600 pounds, and you can just run a quarterback sneak on third and short, fourth and short. Look, man, they have a very, very high floor. A very, very high floor. And that's why they're at where they're at now. They're at 3-0, and they haven't even played more, better than B-plus football, in my opinion. They've, they've left at least 10 to 15 points on the board in each one of those games. All right, so, look, great, great, great game by the Eagles, stepping up and getting it done on the road where they had to, how they had to. And then last but not least, the defense. And you know exactly who I'm going to mention. And uh, Mark, let me know if you if you if you've seen how he's been dominating Jalen Carter, bro. How many teams are sitting there kicking themselves that they didn't draft this young man? He was like a bigger version of Warren Sapp out there, just blowing blowing the line up, just getting to the quarterback. He affected so many throws, and then he had the forced fumble. You know, my man caught the ball, and he didn't even see Jalen Carter coming from the backside, and boom, fumble. You can say it's the rain and the ball slippery and all that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But he didn't see Jalen Carter rev rev the engine up into drop the gear the the engine down to first gear and then just be on his ass like that. And boom, ball out fumble. After we had a turnover, he comes out, boom, turnover. That's the type of impact you're getting there, man. And I'm looking over here at the comments, man. Um, yo, Mark, you you're you're, you're Dead on. He's the next Aaron Donald, no doubt. Man, if we could get him to be 80% of what Aaron Donald is, that's a Hall of Famer that we're never going to forget. And I think he can be as good as Aaron Donald. If you're, you're seeing it already. The same way as Aaron Donald was, he Aaron Donald it took him five games to come in and have an immediate impact. And you're seeing the same thing with Jalen Carter. I mean, damn, how many sacks does he have already? In his young NFL career. He has at least two or three. If not more. And he has tackles for losses already. And that defense is flying. Reed Blankenship. Welcome back sir. Coming back. Making hits. Getting interceptions. Playing that robber zone over the middle in the cover one. And boy, Baker Mayfield didn't even see him. He, he was. He, they're running that. I don't know if it was a post or if it was a deep end. And. His man's is coming over the middle. He lets that ball go. He doesn't even see Reed sitting in that robber um, hook zone just lurking. And he just broke on it. As the ball was coming out of his hands, he was breaking on the ball. Can't teach that, man. I'm, I'm not saying that he's the best safety in the league, but damn if he ain't pretty good, man. So, look, I love what I'm seeing out of this team. Even when they're playing a B-plus version of their game, they're still better than a lot of teams in this league. And they're only going to play better as they shake the rust off. And I think, just me, let me know what you think. Not playing the preseason games, we're seeing the rust start just starting to come off. We're seeing it just starting to come off. Especially that throw that Jalen Hurts had to uh, Zacchaeus yesterday. That's a throw that he doesn't make in week one. I think the anticipation wasn't there. The timing was a little bit off. Now we're starting to make those throws. Under pressure, nonetheless. So great job, 3-0, and, and, you know, moving forward to um, try to go 4-0 this Sunday. And let me know what you guys think about the Eagles and what they've done. I'm going to briefly touch on the Raiders. There's not really much to say about that besides the fact that we, we suck ass. Josh Jacobs can't get any room to breathe, let alone gain a yard behind that offensive line. Jimmy Garoppolo, I mean, he's treading water, but... Besides being able to throw to Devontae Adams, what what else do we, are we really doing out there? We really struggled on, what was it, Sunday night. Yeah, we, we struggled on, on Sunday night against those, um, those Steelers. We struggled real bad. I was watching it. I was out at a bar, and I was watching the game, and it just, we came back to, to make it close near the end, but, you know, it was just, the offense is stagnant. The defense can't stop anybody. I mean, Marcus Epps is the only redeeming quality in that secondary right now. Max Crosby, obviously, he always always doing his thing. But Chandler Jones, nowhere to be seen. Um, you know, we're, we are a work in progress. I, I, I know that. But they're going to have to seriously do something about the quarterback situation and consider what they're going to do going into next year's draft because th this is not – it's not the move. Not the move, fam. 
So Raiders fans, you know, leave your comments in here. It's it's not a whole bunch of sunshine and rainbows here, but we make them do with what we have right now. So that's what I have for the NFL. Uh, leave a comment. Let me know what you guys think. And then I'm going to quickly segue over to the Phillies. You see the hat. We clinched the um, wild card spot. Congratulations. We clinched it last night. So I know Rob Thompson said he was resting pretty much damn near everybody today and moving forward as we close the season out. Aaron Nola might get another start if he needs it. But quote unquote from Rob Thompson Unless he's really dying to get some innings and he just needs to keep the arm warm, he's not going to play anymore this season. You know, you're just getting ready for the playoffs. You know, you look at this this Phillies team, We right now we're sitting as the number four seed, I believe. And if the season ended today, we would be playing the number five seed Diamondbacks in a wild card series. And the winner of that series would go on to play in the NLDS versus the Braves. All right, so we already know who, who we're going to see if and when we get back past the Diamondbacks or whoever ends up as the number five seed. Uh, right now, the standings, you have the Phillies. They clinched one of the spots. The Diamondbacks are in the second wildcard spot. And then the Chicago Cubs have the third seed wildcard spot right now. That would be the sixth seed total. However, the Marlins are only a half game back of the Cubs. And then the Reds are one and a half games back of the Cubs. So, a lot of things can shake up in the next couple of days. So the Diamondbacks might even fall out of their spot if they just stink it up over the next, they have four games. Yeah, if they lose all four games, which is unlikely, then they could end up out of this. But I think I think the, the Phillies and the Diamondbacks will be in, and then the Cubs, they're trying to hold on. That's going to be the interesting one here. Could be the Marlins, could be the Cubs. I don't know about the Reds. I don't know what they're doing, but that's where we stand in this playoff run coming up, man. Red October is almost here. And little fun fact here, the data, according to CBS News, says that the playoff-bound Phillies hit their low point on June 2nd. All right? Now, this is something of interest to me. On June 2nd, the Phillies dropped their fifth straight game. A painful one where we fell behind the Nationals six nothing early, battled back to tie the game at seven in the top of the eighth, and then we let them rally for a run in the bottom of the inning, and we lost eight to seven. Think about that. Think about that. We were twenty five and thirty two at that point. Twenty five and thirty two. That dropped us into a tie for last place in the NL East. We were at last pick placed. Now for now for context. Look at where we're at now. We are in second place behind the Atlanta Braves with the number one wild card spot in the NL. The bottom team in the NL East right now is the Washington Nationals at 69 wins, 89 losses. We leapfrog the Nationals, the Mets, and the Marlins to be right behind the Atlanta Braves in the division. And we leapfrog a lot of teams to have the number one wild card spot. You look at how good this team was down the stretch. Since June 2nd, the Phillies have won 63 games, more than any team in the whole damn league outside of the Atlanta Braves. So really think about how much work the Phillies have put in since really struggling. And you remember those days where Trey Turner couldn't hit the broad side of a barn and he was getting booed and he finally got the cheers and he turned it around. Then Cassiano's... He started heating up real heavy. Then Ram Muto started heating up, and everybody started heating up. The bats came alive, and boom. These things don't happen out of mid, uh, thin air. It's not magic or smoke and mirrors. No, it's hard work and making the proper adjustments in the heat of battle. Because you don't get it. You don't get no time to sit back and figure it out while you don't have to play any games. No, you have to figure this out while you're trying to keep up in the playoff race. Not only did they figure it out, but they came in and established themselves as one of the hottest teams in baseball, similar to the way they were last year. Had a a, a very shaky start, middle of the season was I, and then by the time September came in, we were the hottest team in baseball going into the playoffs. Even more than the 100 win Mets, even more than the Braves. And what did we do in the playoffs? We beat the Braves. Now, I mean, we came in and took care of business. So, this is a great time 
to have the bats hot, the pitching be as solid as it needs to be. The bullpen still, still needs to iron some things out, but they are hot at the right time. All right, I'm reading another comment here from Mark. I still don't get why Schwarber leads off terrible average and slow as hell. It never made sense to me. I, it, ne it doesn't make sense to me either. You know, they keep making this argument that he has a high percentage of walks. And when he gets a piece of one, he sends it out. Cool. Okay, he's getting on base. But the fact that you don't have Trey Turner leading off, who can hit for average. He has been hitting for average since he's picked it up. You know, since he got the standing ovation, that's the whole point of signing him is to have him as the leadoff hitter. He gets on base. He's a speed demon. You, he got you. You got you got your head on a swivel because you don't know if he's going to take off. Then you bring up the Kyle Schwarbers and the Bryce Harpers of the world and the JT Ramuts. I, I I'm with you. I'm I'm with you right there. I think it's they're wasting his power, even though he's he passed 100 RBIs this year already. I think now. He'd be sitting at 150 or 160 if he was sitting in the three or four spot. So, look, I'm right there with you, bro. Um, I don't see them changing it. And hopefully we can get a World Series out of it and the experiment works out to its full conclusion. But, yeah, it logically doesn't make sense to me. So, let me know what you guys think about that. Um, where you, Who you think the Phillies will be playing for the walk card game and um, if you're going to be ready when it comes, all right? Um, next, let's go ahead and briefly talk about our last two topics. One being Damian Lillard being traded, finally. And he gets traded, not just to anybody, but to the former NBA champions uh, two to three years ago, the Milwaukee Bucks, man. So you're going to have Giannis and Damian Lillard on the same team? That's that's wild to me, fam. They, they're really loaded right now out in Milwaukee. All right, so details of the trade, according to Woj. Um, they traded, uh, the Blazers get Drew Holiday and DeAndre Ayton in a three-team trade, and Damian Lillard goes to the Bucks. Very, very, very interesting trade. Uh, Phoenix lands Yusuf uh, Nurkic, uh, Grayson Allen, Nasir Little, and Keon Johnson. A Milwaukee, what did they get? Um, Milwaukee traded away DeAndre Ayton, Drew Holiday. Okay, uh, unprotected first round pick in 2029 from Milwaukee and an unprotected Milwaukee uh, uh, swap, right swap in 2028 and 2030 to the Blazers. So, hey, Blazers got a pretty decent return for a future Hall of Famer who's still performing at a high level. I don't know if they would have gotten anything better. You get to swap rights with the Buccaneers, I mean, the Buccaneers, the Bucks in 2028 and 2030, and then you get an unprotected first-round pick in 2029, that's pretty good. Because right now, last time I checked, it's 2023, and in six years, I don't know if Dame Lillard will still be, still be here. We don't know where Giannis will be in six years, and those picks might be very, very valuable. So I think this is a deal that worked out for all parties involved, and hey, <laughs> the East just got a thousand times more difficult. Let me know what you guys think about that one. That, that surely shook up the league today. And then last but not least, I will be dropping a prediction video for the big fight coming up this Saturday between Jamel Charlo and Canelo Alvarez on Showtime pay-per-view. I'll be giving my prediction video just like I did with the Terrence Crawford and Earl Spence fight. If you didn't check that video out, please do because... I was on point, not just down to the outcome, but down to the combinations that would land and give who we all know the victory, the victory. So check that video out. I'll be dropping another video in that level of detail, going over tendencies that each guy has, going through some of the combinations and things we like to do, some of the different fights, and giving a little bit of a film review, as well as giving my predictions and then, you know, just get into the fight. You know, this is going to be my birthday, my extended birthday weekend celebration with fireworks, I, I would hope, on Saturday. And then in the undercard, you have Eric Lubin. He's going to be fighting on the undercard. And then a second fight on the undercard is going to have Yordanis Ugas, who lost to Earl Spence. Um, That was the fight before 
I think that was Earl Spence's last fight before he fought Terrence Crawford. He was able to stop Ugas. But Ugas, you know, if you remember, he was able to beat Manny Pacquiao for his WBA belt at 147 in a fight where Manny Pacquiao was still considered one of the top welterweights at that time, even at 42 years old, 40, 42. Either way, you know, you're talking about a very, very good fighter. And, and you're, De you're Dennis Ugas who's getting a chance to get things back on track for himself. You never know what's next for him if he gets a nice showing during his fight on Saturday. So, hey, a lot to talk about. Be on the lookout for that. And then, um, yeah, we're going to get ready for this this next Eagles game coming up on Sunday as well as this next Raiders game coming up on Sunday. Uh, looking for the Eagles to go 4-0 and looking for the Raiders to turn it the upper round. Uh, with that being said, um, thanks for tuning in. Leave a comment, leave a like on the video, both on here, on the stream, on Facebook, as well as on YouTube. And go check the channel out, man. I promise I got great content for y'all. Um, and that's it. Until next time, be safe, and I'll talk to y'all. Peace.